This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Eurograps Express, I'm your host Neil David, and NXT UK is dead, it's gone, it's been nailed to the perch, it's pushing up the daisies, how do I feel about it, I, I don't know, I mean this is, I'll be completely honest with you, I'm, I'm really a bit all over the shop with this one, I think it's something that we're going to have to spend a little bit of Socratic conversation on, I think we're going to have to talk about it and, and see how we feel. Um Honestly, though, I think overall, I just feel a little bit sad. You know, it's weird when you take a step back and you look at what NXT UK was, as we can now say. It's just got a, a, a tinge of sadness to it, hasn't it? There's not really any highlights to go through. There's a couple of good matches, I suppose. But really, it's just been a forgotten show on BT. Yet we're somehow going to be feeling the ramifications of it for a long time to come. And we and we have been feeling them for the last few years. I found out on Thursday, like everyone else, and I, and I found out in a bar. I was, and I have to say, there's a, I've got to talk about food at some point in the show. There's a bar near me that's opened. And it's within a 10 minute walking distance. And it's got this thing that I know some, some of you, you know, beefy boys who go to pubs and would, might get annoyed about. But, it's a bar and you go in and you sit down and it's a menu and it's got all your beers and wines and spirits and cocktails, everything you'd expect in a, in a regular pub or bar. But it's got charcuterie boards and cheese boards and all sorts of stuff. And I'm sat there with my wife. My wife and I, we work very long hours. And we sat there and we're having a few drinks and I'm, I'm you know, pretending that I can taste fruit in the beer that I'm drinking, even though it all just tastes like hops to me. And we're enjoying some the cheeses of the UK. Um, and then my phone just started buzzing and going a bit mad. And I don't really have any friends. So I was a little bit surprised. So I had a look and I, there was a lot of DMs and things and Slack chats and discords going off. And my initial instinct was to sort of do the classic VOW, the VOW victory lap. You know, on this uh, podcasting network, we're keen on a victory lap. We get excited. And I've been a, I've been a very vocal opponent, I suppose, of if that's the, the right phrase, of NXT UK. Um, to the point that I've never talked about it really on the show in the last eight months or however long I've been doing it, other than to say I don't talk about it. Those who've been listening for a while will know that I've had quite a few existential breakdowns about progress and I've, I've sort of built myself up to the point now where I, I just don't want to watch it. And I was at that point with NXT before it even started, really, NXT UK. Um, but yeah, like I say, I'm building myself up for this, this sort of victory lap to say that I, you know, I was right to dismiss it and I was right to be angry at it for all these years and... By the time I'd stumbled home, which obviously took me twice as long because I was walking from side to side because I'd had a few beers, I didn't really want to. I just felt a bit sad because on that walk home, I'd kind of weighed it all up on the scales. You know, what was taken from us by NXT UK, but what we got as a benefit. And it's important that as we're talking about this, that we do, to a certain extent, try and take a balanced approach. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to say things that I don't believe. That doesn't mean I'm going to say things that I don't think are true. But it is important sometimes that, especially me, I can get carried away. And I need to sometimes take a little bit of a step back and, and try and get keep those scales in my head and try and weigh things up a little bit. And I should sort of take that opportunity to point out that I'm going to say things that you might not like on this episode. 
you know, I'm going to say things that you, you might not agree with. And that's okay. To use a Lanzarism, reasonable minds can disagree. And I'm always up for Socratic conversation. I'm always up for you coming in the Voices of Wrestling Discord and going to the Eurograps Express room. Or um, adding me on Twitter at Eurograps EXP and talking to me on there. Or DMing me, whatever you want to do. But the one thing I'm not going to take, and I'm just going to save you some, some effort now if this is what you're thinking of doing. Don't bother with the they were just putting food on their table argument. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on. But I will just want to say, it is your right as a viewer, as a fan, and a consumer to see the art that you consume through that lens. Through the lens as a fan. You are under no obligation to sit in a half-empty electric ballroom watching a Big Guns Joe match be feeling glad that some future shock mid-carder is having a Sunday roast. That is not your obligation. Also, you can have issues with the ethics and morality of NXT UK without you thinking that these people should be starving to death. There is a perfectly reasonable middle ground. And I'm, I'm, the reason why I'm saying that so vehemently is because I've seen some people who are saying, oh, so you're glad people are getting fired. And it tends to be bookers of very prominent promote promotions who were involved with the WWE. So just be very, very careful about those kind of arguments because they're silly. Anyway, I'm having a, a, a made-up argument with someone who doesn't even exist. But I think, ultimately, what we lost from the scene from NXT UK was that hierarchy. Um, again, we could talk about individual cases and we talk about nuances in a minute, but the overall thing that I think we lost was the hierarchy of the scene. It's become really apparent to me in recent years that what young developing wrestlers need is that ladder, those steps to work their way through. I've spent a lot of time going to wrestling all my life, and I've I've always enjoyed finding different levels of wrestling to go to. You know, I've been to the Copper Box, I've been to a WW Arena shows, but then I go to trainee shows that are 20 minute walk from my house. And I've seen that full spectrum of wrestling for such a long time. And what I've started to see in these last four or five years or so is all these wrestlers, so many talented wrestlers that just needed that hierarchy. They just needed to be put in positions appropriate to their talent. And in the last five years, we've just had this really bizarre scene where we've got an idea of promotions being incredibly prominent and progress is the one that immediately springs to mind. And yet you've got wrestlers who aren't ready for that spot. And that's not a criticism. And well, it is. I mean, it's a criticism in the traditional sense is that you are critiquing. It's not a criticism as in I'm slagging them off. You know, it's just a fact of life that you need to be around people who are at your, who are at the appropriate level for you. You can't just put a rocket ship on everyone and rocket them straight to the top and expect it to be believable. Remember, kayfabe is a two-way thing. You have to invest in it yourself as well. You have to be able to believe it as an audience member. And suddenly being told that these people, two weeks out of training school, are the stars of Brit Rest, and you've got people online going, Brit Rest is alive and well, and you're seeing it. It's that dichotomy. It's not. And it's, it's, it's been this bizarre scene. And what have we got in return from NXT UK? Because that's what it caused, because it just, it, it just sucked all the talent up. It just went and grabbed them before World of Sport got them. It just grabbed them, picked them up and put them in Enfield, in a warehouse, never to be seen again, essentially, because nobody watched it. Never really did anything. They had a couple of takeovers, I suppose, but nobody did anything significant. And what did we get on the other side? What was the benefit of that happening? I, I, I don't know what it is. I don't know what the benefit of NXT UK was. It's left the scene in a worse place than it found it. 
And it's not really given us anything to sink our teeth into. So let's go back to the the announcement then. So we got this this press release and it says, following the success of our live events and talent identification efforts throughout all of Europe, we believe this is the perfect time to expand NXT beyond the UK. Guess who said that? Shawn Michaels, the heartbreak kid, or as he's now known, the WWE Vice President of Talent Development Creative Kid. What a... That is about as WWE as local medical facility. The amount of lies and mistruths and utter, utter doggy do that is within that statement is almost baffling. Following the success of our live events, which one? Which one are you thinking of? Because they dried up pretty quickly and they went into TV tapings that nobody went to. Not only did nobody go to the tapings, nobody watched the show. And it kind of reminds me of one of the reasons, at least, is why I stay away from rating conversations in general. First of all, it's not really where my strengths lie. I've said that quite a few times now, haven't I? That, uh, my strengths kind of lie in, in analysing wrestling as story and art and, and presentation, that sort of thing. But also, it feels like wrestling as a TV product has just become, well, just that, isn't it? It's just content, just hours to fill. Like, is it is it content? Does it exist? And we say, yeah. And, and, and then that's good enough. And, and that's kind of what NXT UK was. It was just content. It just it just existed. It was just things happening on a screen that, that passed the time slightly on the, you know, it reminds me of like a, like <laughs> of that Philip Larkin poem, doesn't it? I work all day and get half drunk at night, waking at four to soundless dark I stare. In time, the TV will grow light and show me NXT UK. The, set, the next statement is talent identification efforts throughout all of Europe. I mean, what talent have you identified? Walter, the, one of the most captivating, brilliant wrestlers to come off the continent in the past 10 years, who, by the way, was allowed to bubble and work his way up on the German scene, who was spoken about in whispers, who gradually improved and got better and more interesting, and finally became the Walter that we loved, that had that brilliant aesthetic that could work to it, that could deliver these unique, brilliant matches that we it felt like we, we hadn't seen before, even though we had in the 80s, and he brought it out and made it fashionable again, and made it interesting and exciting, and breathed life into it. And then he went to WWE, and I'll never forget it. It was the I say I don't talk about NXT, but back when I was writing for Voices of Wrestling, I reviewed the first NXT UK takeover, kind of out of obligation as much as anything. It was it felt like somebody should do it, and because I was reviewing RevPro a lot of the time, it, it sort of fell to me. Or it didn't. I mean, I, I could have said no, but it, it felt like I, I should do it. It felt like something that I should talk about. I remember watching the match with Joe Coffey. Or was it Mark Coffey? It's one of the coffees. And I got used to seeing Walter as this big bruiser who just come out and be desperate to get this big slap in to, to cave somebody's chest in. And we'd all be waiting for it. The audience would be anticipating it. I remember seeing him against Will Ospreay, the best match I've ever seen Walter have uh, in uh, Ultringham at the ice rink. He was part of the Red Pro New Japan uh, joint show. And it was this brilliant dance of Osprey trying to avoid this big chop and Walter trying to deliver it. And then we finally got that big slap that was so satisfying yet devastated at the same time. It was it was kind of like they, they played the start of the match. Like, do you know, before something really bad happens, like if you've ever been in a car crash and you can feel that the impact is about to come, like not feel it physically, but you can, you can sense it and you know and time slows down and you're just waiting for that impact and you're bracing yourselves for it. And that's how they played the match. And then I watched this NXT UK TakeOver match and one of the coffees was working his limb. 
And he was working from underneath for about 15 minutes. And they completely misunderstood what Walter is. And the only reason why he's still vaguely anything as Gunther is because he's such a naturally charismatic, exciting wrestler that he's overcoming what the WWE have done to him. That applies to Butch as well. Old Pete Dunne. Old Pete not the way done. He's such a great wrestler that he could overcome this tragic... Pe- this. I, I'm sorry if this offends anyone. I, I find something about Peaky Blinders to be so tragic. I, re- I don't get it at all. I, I, I mean, you... I, <laughs> and I'm speaking as somebody who does a podcast about British and European wrestling, and I find it, and I find it tragic. But there's just something deeply tragic about people who dress the babies up as a Peaky Blinders man. Uh, in Manchester, there's a bar dedicated to Peaky Blinders, and all the all the barmen wear like they are. I just think it's, it's cringe. But he can overcome that because he's Butch, because he's Pete Dunne. He's not Butch. He's Pete Dunne. I mean, who else have you identified? I mean, Dewdrop's good. I like Dewdrop. She's all right. Tyler Bate, you haven't done anything with. You've not put him in a position. I mean, they're the three, aren't they? They're the three stars, I think. There's Tyler Bate, uh, Pete Dunn, Walter. If you wanted those people, why not just sign them? You don't have to go through this talent identification effort, as they put it, throughout all of Europe. And they've said that they, you know, Sean has said that they believe this is the perfect time to expand NXT beyond the UK. And it's strange because NXT UK has German wrestlers, Irish wrestlers, Spanish wrestlers, French wrestlers. Really, what it needed was a rebranding. You could have just called it NXT Europe and kept it the way it is. But instead, they've fired everybody. They've kept a few people, like the ones I've mentioned. They've also kept Gallus, which I feel if you really wanted Gallus, all you had to do was ask. Honestly, you could have had him. I wouldn't have even... It wouldn't be like them, them pogs you had as a kid that you didn't even want. You'd have just given him away to your neighbour you felt sorry for. You can have a Gallus. Who wants Gallus? And I don't even, I know the flagship love the theme tune. You you can, you can even have that as a sweetener. We'll give you the theme tune to tech them. But this statement from Shawn Michaels, the WWE Vice President of Talent, I've just realised, what does that even mean? The WWE Vice President of Talent Development Creative. Is that like a three trick? Is it talent development and creative? Because they've put it as one thing. He's the vice president of talent development creative. Is this like some bizarre live, laugh, love they have in the Enfield dojo, talent development creative? Anyway, so they've, they've dropped all these people and then they're starting NXT Europe, which there's some deep Twitter rumours that are saying actually they do have something planned. But I don't know, based on what we know right now, I kind of just smell a rat with this. At best, at best, this stinks of fire and rehire. One of the most predatory, disgusting tactics that businesses do. Where they have all these workers and don't, like, again, something that I will not um, entertain. These aren't, pri- these aren't um, what's the word, independent contractors. These are people who are employed by the WWE. We know they can't work where they want, so they're not independent contractors. And they fired them all, and they're, I assume, going to rehire ones they want for NXT Europe under new contracts. I don't know that, but then why fire them? It's just a, a really sort of strange thing if it even happens, this NXT Europe. I can't imagine what the benefits of an NXT Europe are going to be that you weren't already getting with NXT UK. You hired everybody. You had the almost complete talent pool. You had TV on BT Sport, which, I mean, realistically, that was as good as you were going to get for something like that, wasn't it? You know, you weren't going to get it on... a a traditional channel it's an over-the-top channel for those who who aren't in the uk but they have premier league games and a lot of people have it 
You know, it's not it's not Sky Sports, but it's not Premier Sports. It's sort of in between. I mean, I have it. I mean, I have it for the MotoGP. I love watching the bikes. You know, it's something that's in a lot of homes. And it, again, this is where that sort of nuance comes from, that I, I've sort of had to kind of reevaluate how I feel about these workers because the first time I ever wrote about NXT UK, and I wrote about it in that article, that review I was telling you about a second ago, and I used a very emotive word to describe the people who work, who, who signed these contracts. I used the word scabs. Now, for those who don't know, a scab is... Um, when there's strike action on, the workers have decided to go on strike. A scab is someone who crosses the picket line and goes against the workers and sort of sides with the bosses, basically. Someone who crosses the picket line and goes to work anyway and yet probably takes the benefit of strike action later on. And um, several progress commentators or people who were uh, commentators for progress at the time really jumped down my throat about it. And, you know, I got the whole food on the table thing and I, 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 got, I got a right sort of battering for it. And... I can learn and I can grow. Um, and in a lot of ways, to be honest with you, I completely stand by it. There are certain people who I think are pathetic for signing those contracts. There are certain people who I do really judge for not just signing those contracts, but for the way they uh, evangelised themselves afterwards and they big they boosted this project, this capitalist project, as if it was some benefit to everybody and it was there were only benefits Yet there are some people who I just think weren't really left with much of a choice later on, were they? Once that initial batch of signees across the picket line, what was everybody else supposed to do if you were going to make a living off wrestling? And I certainly don't think it's right that these people, no matter what led them to get to this point, you know, to be fired and potentially rehired is 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 disgusting. I mean, to be fired just out the blue is disgusting. And, and there are people, it's important to remember that there are people who aren't wrestlers. There are people who, you know, administration and stuff like that, who I assume are on the chopping block as well. I don't know, but it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? So, as you can see, I'm on the one hand, I feel very strongly about it. But then as soon as you have that strong feeling, you think, well, what about this? It's just... But there's no positive with it. There's there's at no point in any of this do I do I think well here was the benefit. I, I I don't I don't see it at all. I mean there are certain people like Pete Dunne and Trent Seven who I, I think at the, with their grandstanding and their pearl clutching are unforgivable. Do you remember Justin Sizem did his uh, the World of Sport champion did his uh, letter to everybody saying you know he's going to go his own way. And he got the not the way and delete this now. This is a benefit from everyone. And that really, really wound me up. And it wound me up on a lot of different levels. Because I think the main one is what a lot of these people wanted, these initial batch of, batch of signees, is they wanted that bag of money, but they also wanted the critical acclaim that came with it and the respect. The bag of money was what you got. The bag of money was all you were guaranteed. And the fact that everybody sort of in the audience, or it seemed like a lot of people, universally thought this was a bad decision, based on history, by the way, and based on really obvious reporting, that the only reason why this was made is because World of Sport existed. People were right to be critical of you taking that deal. And if that money, because they weren't on the basic deals, that was the rumour anyway, they were on the bigger deals. And if that money was enough for you to be able to get over that, then that's fine. I have to accept that decision. But the idea that we have to respect that decision is nonsense. And they took it a step further and, and acted like we had to admire the decision. And that it was this amazing thing for the British scene, despite the fact that it really obviously wasn't. And despite the fact that history did not support that. Do we really need a history lesson on McMahon and the territories? I mean, I'm probably not the one to give it to you anyway. I know I've just read the book like everybody else. Go and read Liam Burns' writing. It's fantastic stuff. But then the balance side comes in. Because a lot of the people that went later on weren't paid these big contracts. They weren't, 
given these big money deals. They were basically, I mean, the rumour was, and this again is just rumour and conjecture at this point, but the rumour was essentially supermarket level wage. They were given like a basic standard wage to do it. They certainly weren't raking in any big bucks to, to, to be forgotten about on BT Sport 2. And again, that just adds a tinge of sadness to it, doesn't it? It doesn't excuse anything. It doesn't make you think, oh, all right, then maybe it was a good thing. It just makes it a little bit sad, doesn't it? You kind of go from being angry about it to sad about it, I suppose. I think what's annoying is, is it was just all so obvious. And I think sometimes it's uncouth to say, I told you so, but... Sometimes it's also accurate, and it, it, it when you think back to that world of sport series, which is what this was all made to fight. I remember watching that episode. Was it on? It was either New Year's Eve or New Year's Day, wasn't it? And either way, we had we had people round, and it was on at like seven o'clock or whatever. And I remember I caused it hassle with my wife because we had friends round. They were her friends. I wasn't that bothered, but it was like I'm going in the other room and I'm watching wrestling for an hour. And I'm, I've got like my notepad under my arm, you know, like ready to, like ready to, because like I was reviewing it, I think, and I was, I was at least going to have to mention it at some point, so I wanted to take notes. And she, I remember just looking at me as if to say, "Wait, we're in the middle of where we've got people around." And I remember watching it, and I caused this trouble with my wife. I suppose I mean, she, she, whatever, she got over it. She knew what she married, um, but I remember watching it thinking this is terrible and I, I i don't know what i expected from itv's new wrestling and it was kind of it was presented wasn't it like um gladiators or you know new not all gladiators when it was good new gladiators or these kind of the bring on the wall kind of a, a vibe to it that kind of feel that's tacky tv and not in not in a good way like you know wcw back in the day like a really kind of tacky saccharine ITV family Saturday production and that's what they essentially went scorched earth on the UK scene to 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 fight at the European scene I should say but that that's what that that's what led to it just this awful wrestling show that I mean tell you what you get these people on Twitter who say rampage is bad I think you know, like, I think of when you see people and they'll give a match, like, one star that's perfectly fine and you just think, like, how jaded are you? Apparently, the rumour is that's what grapple app users do. I mean, I'm speaking as a grapple app user myself. Apparently, they're all grumpy. You know, we take a star off everything. You know, I think these people need to go back and watch that World of Sport episode because it was trash. It's, it's bad, is it? The point is, it's bad that this whole thing was was created to com- combat something that barely existed, and at best is a brief trivia note. Yet for some reason, just managed to to hang on for years and years and years. Like that with that Stokely Hathaway quote: "You could be wanted by the FBI and be employed by NXT UK, and nobody will find you because they seem to avoid cut after cut after cut after cut, didn't they?" I think the most interesting thing now, today, on the Saturday that I'm thinking about, is what's going to happen now. Because there doesn't seem to be much in the way of of no-compete clauses for these people. There was initial rumours. I think Fightful reported that they'd heard that maybe some had 30 or 45. But I've seen Miller McKenzie's taking a lot of bookings. Wild Boar's taking a booking. Uh, Eddie Dennis has turned up on uh, Rev Pro, uh, and it's it's interesting to see what's going to happen now with those people because it almost feels, and I, I I don't know if this I'm getting too emotional about this and getting too silly, but it almost feels like like it's different now, isn't it? Like these people, you. You can't just come back to the scene and expect it to be the way it was when they left because it is incredibly different. It's quieter. It's less successful. There's less money going around. There are fewer shows. 
and that's obviously not just for NXT UK. There are other reasons there as well. But it's just a very, very different scene than what they left. And there are some questions hanging over it. It feels for some of them, and it, it, I, I stopped caring after a while. I just had that thing of, of, of somebody went to NXT UK and I just they, they just didn't really exist anymore. They just retired from wrestling and I forgot about them. But it sort of had that thing of, like, say a singer you really like or a band you really like auditioned for X Factor. And in a way, it's all still the same but they kind of took a bit of a, a shortcut and you kind of lose a little bit of respect for them. And I think that that's the one thing that I think is quite a controversial take is that I have the people that sign the contracts. I understand it. I sympathize with them in some ways because of what's happened to them. But also I have lost a little bit of respect for them. And it's that's going to be something that, that I'm going to find hard to get back because I'm somebody who values wrestling. And those people went to a company that won't even say the word wrestling. And some of, as much as I can sympathize with some of the later signees because maybe the work wasn't there where it was before, at the same time, you also knew what you were signing up for. Again, this isn't, you know, the food on the table argument. This isn't people working at a call center putting 50p in the lecky meter. This is people pursuing a wrestling dream. They're very, very different things. And it's it's disingenuous to analyse them on the same level. And yeah, if you chose that easy way out, you chose that shortcut, I do think less of you as a wrestler because you don't prioritise the craft in the way that I want my wrestlers to prioritise the craft. What happened when they went to Japan? What happened when they tried to start NXT Japan? There's a little bit of shame there, I think, when that comparison is brought up. A little bit of embarrassment. So what do we do now when they come back? Like, what happens? Because I'll tell you what, as and I, I always dig for the positives on this show, and that's kind of the point. It's not toxic positivity. I will call things out when I see him, and long-time listeners will know that, but we go looking for the good stuff. We still believe in this scene on this show, and we still go looking for things, and it's mainly in Red Pro, <laughs> but, we do, but we do go looking for the good stuff. But what do we do with the people like Robbie X, who have established themselves now as mainstays of the British wrestling scene? What do we do with the people like Luke Jacobs who finally got it, who are finally getting it together and finally becoming a star? Because they're the people that stay behind and they're the people who I kind of want to support more. They're the people who I want to see remain in that prominent position. But then we put in that, you know, I'm going to use his name again because I've already used it today, so I don't want to bring anyone else into it. But what do you do with the likes of a Big Guns Joe? What do we do with these wrestlers that are only in the positions they're in? You know, Alana Austin, whoever, that are only in the position they're in because the scene was so depleted. Someone like Luke Jacobs would have got his spot eventually. Robbie X was always around in some way or another. He maybe wouldn't have been as prominent as he is now. But what do we do with those people who have stuck around, who have worked hard, yet they're suddenly going to, be replaced by these people who've been dogging it on BT Sport 2. I don't care how hard... I can see here the response to that. I don't care how hard you work in a warehouse in Enfield. I do not care. It doesn't matter to me how hard you train. What matters to me as a wrestling fan, and should matter to you as a wrestling fan, is the wrestling that you see in front of you. And it's weird to me. And I'm going on a bit of a rant now. and I, I've, I've been stopping myself, but I'm going to do it. It's so bizarre to see these tweets from all these workers saying, you know, oh, I'm grateful for the memories. What memories? Going to Nando's after your Enfield training session, that's not a memory. I'm glad for you. You've got that memory. I'm happy for you. I think it's brilliant. What have we got as the British wrestling fans? What did we get out of NXT UK? I don't eat the food on your table. I don't have these brilliant memories. 
It's so bizarre now. Do you see these tweets and the list? All oh, the lists are back, uh, and I have a real bugbear. This is, and I, I'm recognizing, by the way, how unreasonable I am with this. But I have a real, <laughs> really agitates me when wrestlers put out these lists of people they want to wrestle that are kind of on the indies or like New Japan or whatever when they've been signed to WWE because. If you really wanted to wrestle those people, you could have done it. Because I've seen it from good wrestlers, from wrestlers I really like. You could have done that. You chose a different path. If you don't expect me now to believe that that's what you really wanted all along, because if that was what you really wanted all along, you could have had it. realistically i think we've got to be a little bit i've got to sort of hold my emotions in a little bit and just have a look at at, at the quality of the worker and see what we do with the, with this sudden influx of talent because there are people who are great and that that we could really do with you know millie mckenzie was one who who was brought up earlier on i think she's a really good wrestler I think she's still very, very young. And I think the NXT UK system has been a detriment to her because she's, she, as always, and I've said this all along, is that wrestlers are better working in front of as many crowds as possible. You're not going to get that in NXT UK. But she's somebody who is really good. Mark Andrews is an excellent, excellent wrestler. He's somebody who should pretty much have the pick of where he goes. Flash Morgan Webster, a wrestler I really like. Wild Boar, a wrestler I really like. It'll be really interesting, though, to see a lot of these people, what they actually do and where they actually go. I suspect a lot of them will end up in progress. I know they've already announced Millie McKenzie, but I expect a lot of them will just end up in progress. I'm going to have to start watching it then, aren't I? Anyway... That's NXT UK. It's just hard, isn't it? Just difficult. It's just, it's just a little bit of... Th- there is no good sort of angle to this. You know, the, the anger is a little bit pathetic, I think, from me now. It's not really got much to do with me other than my analysis of it. But it's, it's just sort of all a bit... All right. You know, just it all just feels like a bit of a, a that Alan Partridge gift, doesn't it? That shrug of the shoulders. Like, oh, NXT UK is closed. And you just sort of go, all right, okay. And that makes it even more bizarre that they're selling this as this massive positive. They're like, hey, good news. We've found all this talent. We've done all this great stuff in NXT UK. And now we're moving on to Europe and we're making it bigger and better. And it's just like the way this has been sort of manipulated, that very sort of typical WWE way, isn't it? That corporate spin. It reminded me of that discourse about the tank that was around. Was it Bischoff said something stupid about the NXT UK tank? Oh, no, he said he'd let him in, did he? Even though that they, they went in the day, and the, the hours and hours and hours before the show. I actually, if you go on my Twitter, I wrote an article about that. I'm re- I really like it. I retweeted it because of all the fuss around it, about how it was never even a tank in the first place. About when you go back and watch it, it's all a bit pathetic. Uh, but we've been told that it's this amazing, significant moment in wrestling history. Whereas when you actually watch it, it's just a bit weird. Like there's a bit where it's not even the tank and the jeep thing that I, I remember. Because again, it's not a tank; it's a jeep with a tube stuck to it. It's the bit where Triple H is outside this arena that WCW are going to be are going to be uh, wrestling at, and he says to this crowd. Uh, say yeah if you think WCW suck and like no one gets really angry with him or cheers people just sort of look at each other and go I, I quite <laughs> you know this, this face on him almost to say I, I, I quite like it actually I think it's alright uh, which you would expect considering they're at a WCW show uh, but that's NXT UK uh, big success apparently according to Shawn Michaels the head of what was it product talent Live, laugh, love, development. What is it? What's this? What's that? Ridic- uh, Vice president of talent development and creative. Who is the president of talent development creative? Is that um, is that Triple H? Has the as the DX hierarchy flipped? Is it is it all gone um, all got a bit Pete Tongue? 
I suppose that's what happened when you marry the that happens when you marry the boss's daughter. Anyway, let's talk about something a little bit more positive, and let's talk about Royal Quest Two. So New Japan have finally announced officially the upcoming shows of the UK. Uh, it seems like they've been hinting at this forever, uh, but we're officially getting Royal Quest 2 on uh, Saturday, October the 1st, and then Sunday, October the 2nd. It's uh, obviously in London again, as you'd expect. It's at the Crystal Palace Indoor Arena. Um, I've been digging to try and find some uh, sort of capacity information for this, but I've not been able to find any. So if you can let me know, I'd, I'd really appreciate that. Um, I think it might be part of this... Uh, sort of Crystal Palace complex, but the bit that I found says it's got a capacity of 14,000, which, I, I mean, maybe they are doing that and cutting things off or what, I don't know, but it's not called the Indoor Arena. I haven't been able to find very much, so I, I, I don't know. Uh, bit of a step up for the 2019 stuff. Uh, I think the Copper Box did about 7,000, uh, but obviously there was one night. I can't see them going to a smaller venue, really, um, and doing two nights. But we're in a very different position with New Japan. Uh, and I'm a little bit on the fence about going. Uh, it's a little bit less convenient for me because I'm not going to be off work. I've had my holidays this year. Uh, but it's just a bit... I think I'm going to have to give one of those signature bad takes from a British person that seem to be all the rage to sort of bring up on Twitter at the minute. I don't know where this has come from that suddenly British people have no concept of analysing wrestling. Uh, but... Um, I don't know, but I just, I don't know if I want to make the effort for this one. And I'm saying that, having said already on this show many times before, that I think the Copper Box was the best live wrestling experience of my life. It's almost difficult, because it, I mean, you don't have to make those comparisons, do you? You don't have to declare it and have it out there. Uh and I love all sorts of wrestling and I get enjoyment from watching wrestling in pubs and trading venues and, and, and bars and, and what have you. But this just felt like, I mean, this was 2019, wasn't it? When, when New Japan would were, were just red hot and I put New Japan up against pretty much, that era of New Japan, up against pretty much any company's best era. And I think that's the best wrestling has ever been. That, I mean, it was sort of at the tail end, really, of that of that era. Maybe sort of afterwards, but this, there was just something about in that time seeing an IWGP Championship match between Okada and Suzuki. I'll never forget it. I will never forget it. It was it was a special moment singing Kaze Ni Nare with seven thousand five hundred other people because that place was packed. Like they absolutely sold it out, and I remember walking in to the copper box and it's a lovely venue it's really it was built uh for the olympics and the paralympics when we had them in 2012 and it i, I think it was the most modern arena that i'd ever been in at, at, at that point and still to this day and you could just tell it had been designed perfectly uh it, everything was kind of on ground level so you just walked in and you went down it was all very accessible so that you didn't have to worry if you were a disabled person about messing around. There was no sort of weird corners or stairs or lifts or anything. You could just get in and, and like I say, I, I have spina bifida. I'm not in a wheelchair, but up and down stairs can sometimes be a bit of an issue for me. But I never felt I had to worry about it. It was just a lovely venue to be in. But I'll never forget walking, getting a drink. We went to sort of the bars at the car and, the, and we got a drink. And I went, found my seat. And as I came sort of, to the edge and I could see down seeing that blue ring and seeing it was a proper New Japan ring and it was proper New Japan refs and I'd seen New Japan stars loads of times you know Red Pro been bringing them over for years even what culture have been bringing them over and I'd, I'd, I'd seen that joint show uh, the um, between Red Pro and New Japan but it was something about the 
an actual New Japan show and being there with that ring and the refs and, and the announcements. And it just, it was so exciting to be part of. But that New Japan isn't really here anymore, is it? And that's the bad take that I was talking about. It just isn't. And it's. I think people know that it isn't as well. And there are some people that are really defending them. And I, and I get it because I, I will always have this tie to New Japan now. There'll never be a promotion that I completely hand wave. And I, I said a couple of episodes ago that I have become that filthy casual where I've, I've, I've been picking and choosing G1 matches rather than watching them all. But it just isn't the same, is it? And you can tell by the discourse, you know, people are talking now about, you know, a show will finish and it'll be, oh, that was a fun show, wasn't it? It had a little bit, it had a little bit of something for everyone, that show, didn't it? And, you know, you'll get people who work for New Japan taking digs at the Grapple app because they rate matches. <laughs> and they're saying, oh, yeah, Grapple app, grumpy people, but they probably won't enjoy that. But that was a fun show. I mean, these are all big red flags, aren't they, that your shows aren't as good. Like, let's be honest. Because if you think of those New Japan shows of old, those G1 shows, where you'd have three, four plus star matches on a night, you'd have a match of the year contender every other night. You know, you you didn't have to go and say things like that in those days. There's also the fact that it's over two nights as well. I don't know what it is with me. Is I, I, I always have this thing about weekends. It just seems that it's... I'm sure both shows will be great, but it just seems like an absolute huge commitment, doesn't it, to go for two days, especially if you're travelling. You know, it's it's a case of an extra hotel night or sort of taking that time out you know, you're taking that whole weekend rather than just one day. It's the travelling time becomes compressed. I think, I mean, they're in London, so they, they're they going to get enough people you know, from the surrounding areas and things like that. But it, it's just it's just a little bit tricky for me coming from the north, I think. And I, I just feel weird about, I know the answer is go for one, but it just feels a bit weird, doesn't it? But then you see Okada's there. And I, I really feel like, if you have the chance to see a wrestler like Okada, and I've been lucky enough to see him quite a few times now, but if you have the chance to see him, you should. Because he is special. Like, he's an all-time great already. And is he even 30 yet, or is he just 30? But he's an all-time great wrestler. I'm going to put Okada up there with anybody else that you can name. And it might seem strange. It might seem like an awkward thing to say, to say, oh, I put him up there with Mizawa and I put him up there with Kawada. And you might prefer those people. And, and I, I I, probably do as well. Like I probably prefer those, probably prefer those people as well. But there's just something about people missing out on greatness that kind of makes me feel a little bit sad. Like if you want to be really grumpy about Okada and say, oh, he's not that. I mean, he is. He is an all-time great. And if you have the chance to go and see him, then, then you probably should. So I don't know about Royal Quest 2. We'll see. I think if it works out all right, we'll go. It's quite, I'd be quite interested to see the reaction to Okada because there was that video going round of Will Ospreay at, um, at these Red Pro shows, uh, the 10th anniversary weekend, and the crowd were really behind Osprey and there were some really rude chants about Okada. I really do suspect, though, because I've seen a few comments from people about how it might be a little bit awkward when you know Okada comes and all that. I, th- I think it's just the way sort of British people do things. I think it's just our sense of humour uh, that I don't always share on this show. I've been quite, you know, grumpy about stupid chants before now. Uh, but... <laughs> you know there are there you know I, I think it's just one of those things but yeah Royal Quest 2 quite interesting so we've done quite a lot of news this episode and we don't normally do this we normally talk about wrestling so I think we should talk about some wrestling so let's talk about an old favourite of mine the GWF I love GWF, and if anything could get me out of this malaise, it's going to be them. Um, we've been covering them for a while, in fact, ever since the podcast started, and I think they're, they're, they're just a, a promotion that I think I always will. Um, they very much use local talent. They 
put all the shows for free on YouTube, so you've got no excuse for not checking them out. But there's just something about the atmosphere of these shows. And the, the, the wrestling's often really good. Like, I'm not belittling the wrestling uh, by any stretch. It's often really, really good. Um, but there's just something about the people that go that are so enthusiastic and so so lively and, and genuine. And it just it, it's a small room, a couple of hundred people, but just the volume just comes across really well. Um, this started off with one of them uh, metal bands that the kids have nowadays. Um, sort of like a gent sound that Tony Harting had brought along because he's celebrating being the new champ. He beat Axel Tisha in their um, sort of money in the bank cashing at the last show, uh, which led to him having this celebration here at, uh, I forgot the name of the show, <laughs> Summer Smash 7. Um, it was kind of cool. He had that like gent sound that, uh, that uh, I, I know almost nothing about. Um, I like him sugar and I like the new Doom soundtrack, the new Doom video games. Uh, but I, it's, it's one of them sort of genres of music that I always, it's, it's on the list to explore a little bit more, that sort of Gen 0101 sound. Um, nice, simple story here. Senza Volta, Senza Volta came out and challenged, um, you never beat me. You've not beaten me, I want a title shot. And uh, that, that set up the main event, and I thought that's always the sign of a good promotion for me, is, is, is the thing the promotions that do the simple things really well, that they just relax and they're happy to have a situation where, you know, okay, you've not beaten me. Let's see if you can. And I, and I think that's, that's enough for most title matches. And yes, you can start to get more intricate from time to time, but that should be the backbone of wrestling, shouldn't it? Obviously I've, I've talked for a long time about the news and such here, so I won't um, spend too long on every match. Uh, but there's a triple threat tag team match. The originals against Plutz Bruder against uh, Team Crazy Sexy. Um, nothing to really talk about here. John Klinger. Um, I think it was Mike Sherry put in a in a Scorpion Deathlock and, and ended it. Um, then we had Ed Nicara against Urkan Sulkani. Urkan Sulkani has been around in GWF and a few other places for what seems like forever now. Um, but beyond being really, really tall... There doesn't seem all that much to say about him, really. Um, but it's Endicara that I'm looking at because I, I feel like Endicara is is really hit and miss. I watch him sometimes and watch him in WXW and places like that, and I'll be really impressed with him and I'll think he's really cool. And then other times I'll think he feels a bit shindy, and, and I don't always like using that shindy word because I feel like that's a little bit of an insult because when I watch a lot of that style of wrestling, I like a lot of that style of wrestling. I love small room wrestling. I love wrestling that's that's not polished and finished yet. Uh, but Endicara can kind of err on the bad side of that sometimes. And especially against somebody like Urkan Sulkani, because Urkan Sulkani is not good. But I was really surprised here. First of all, the production was superb. <laughs> Rev Pro. Um, he was able to come out look intimidating, look scary. He's, you know, there was sort of strobe lights flashing in his face and the way the camera caught a look and the way he was able to express himself in a very understated but also very intimidating way. I thought it was really cool. I really like Ed Dakara's kind of vibe. Um, he seems terrifying. You know, he seems like somebody who who who, who could stab you in a dark alley. He's He's got that sort of sense of danger to him. Um. I shouldn't have been worried because Endicara was able to completely carry this match. Um, carry job would be a little bit harsh. I think I should say that he led the match. That That's probably a little bit more accurate. Um, his speed was absolutely amazing. And he, he used the bigger man almost as a as a tool in the match to bounce off with chops and slaps and then huge topes. And like I say, GWF just have this wonderful crowd that gets so enthused and so excited. And they got behind this to such an extent. It was really great to see. Smart booking. They kept it really simple. Uh, you know, Urkan would be the base for all these cool flips and bounces and twists that, that um, Endicara was doing. But then he bring them to a close with a big boot. And that that's just exactly what, what this match needed. And it was really good. And it, it kept it simple for the limited big man. It really just just accentuated his strengths, really, for want of a better expression. Um, 
Kara really put Urkan over. Urkan won. Um, so he's definitely owned, owed a, a solid pills or hells, is it? That there's other type of German beer? I don't know. But he's, he owes him a drink anyway. There was a women's title match on this. Kara uh, versus Mila Smith. Um, Mila Smith, really over, really great. I like Mila Smith a lot. Uh, but Kara was lacking. I think she's quite inexperienced, doesn't really have much on cage match anyway, and she's not a wrestler I'm I'm hugely familiar with. She's sort of a she's one of them where I recognise the face and I recognise the name, but I couldn't really tell you where I've seen her. And she didn't really keep up here. Uh, this just felt like a solid win for Mila Smith. I kinda wish it had been a little bit more solid. It was ten minutes long, maybe just shy of that. But I felt like if you want to establish Mila Smith, then just establish her. This was sort of that really weird middle ground between being not quite a squash and not quite a sort of a competitive match. It was kind of in the middle. And I think often with those things, you you, you kind of get the worst of both worlds. And I'm, I'm much more keen these days just to see more squashes. I think that's okay if you've got to put an inexperienced wrestler in. It could go either way, I suppose, can't it? You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But here, I think it would have been, would have benefited from the squash a little bit more. Next up, we have the match that actually got me to watch this show. This is what I, I wanted to see. It was Crow Chester against Mike DeVecchio for the Berlin title. And the, the Berlin title is, is GWF secondary title, kind of their intercontinental title. Um, I really like Crow Chester. He's one of those wrestlers where the gimmick kind of sucks. He's a bit like weird goth kind of gimmick. But he does seem to have toned it down a little bit. And he's one of those wrestlers where he'll always seem to win you over. So he'll come out. And even though I've seen him have lots and lots of great matches, especially this year, I think he's had a great year, I won't be particularly excited to see him. And it's strange, isn't it? I kind of think it's the Naito effect. Like, I don't get excited for Naito matches, even though I've seen him have five-star classics. I've seen him have some of the best wrestling matches of all time, and I still don't get excited to see them um, until they start, and then it all changes. But Vecchio is the one that I'm really into at the minute. There's something in the Brian Cage about Vecchio in that he's just a big bruiser, who does lots of cool power moves, who operates right on the edge of his ability. But there's just something about him that's captivating. They call him the Belgian war machine and he comes out to his dubstep and he's screaming into the into the camera and you just get sort of swept away with him and carried carried, carried away in a wave of violence and terror. Um, and Paul Volsch of the Emerald Flow Show Another show on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. He was uh, he was at this show live and he, he raved about this match. Um, and that man knows wrestling. So if he's, if he's saying you should watch it, then you probably should. Um, so I did. This match had my absolute favourite thing in wrestling. And that's a speedy start. As soon as the bell went, they just ran at each other. And I absolutely loved that. And Crowchester, I think, realised early on that to win... He needed to be too fast for the big lad. And that was just, again, just that little simple story that GWF does really well. Um, that sort of, you know, Crochester was, was fast and he, he, he was out, outsmarting Vecchio until Vecchio caught him and slammed him to the mat. You know, the, that's the thing with these speed against big man matches that you've got to have those punctuation points, haven't you? Those big sort of moments where the speed comes to a halt to almost emphasize the speed that you've had. And they did this really, really well. The cardio was off the charts here from both of these wrestlers. It was absolutely fantastic how quickly they moved around the ring. And there was definitely an element here of get your shit in to talk about the Brian Cage thing from before. But I kind of like that. And it's weird in a way, isn't it, to, to sort of... When you hear people slag that off, that idea of wrestlers just doing loads and loads of cool moves... And I, I feel like sometimes when I'm in like groups of wrestling fans, I almost like nod along sometimes. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, just wrestlers doing cool moves. And secretly inside, I'm thinking, oh, I just really like it when wrestlers do loads of cool moves. Don't get me wrong, I do love a story, and I'm not, you know, I think to get to that tippy top level, there's got to be that element of story there. But sometimes on a wrestling show, 
this is what you need. And, and that's exactly what it was. It was sloppy, but in a, in a good way, you know. But I think what the sloppiness here, because it moves so fast, you were never really given time to breathe all that sloppiness in. So there'd be a moment where Vecchio would botch a bit of a neck breaker. Not in a, not in a dangerous way, no one was injured. But he just wouldn't quite get it right. But then a couple of seconds later, he was doing an amazing drop kick that, that completely juxtaposed his size. So before you'd even had time to recognize that a botch had happened, we were on to the next thing. It's almost like a Mitch Hedberg concert. You don't like one joke. Well, fine. Cause the next one's going to be along in a second. Vecchio, if I'm honest though, is the kind of wrestler who you watch behind your fingers because he's going to do something like in this match, it was a running backdrop and it'll make you question how safe he actually is because everything he does just seems really dangerous and right on the edge of the limits of what he's actually capable of doing. And I do wonder if some of those dorks, I don't know if you saw that tweet going around about do dropping about how she, oh, she really protects her opponent and she did a really dorky thing where she put her hands behind someone's head during a, a a a post a corner post move, and it just looked really saccharine and, and rubbish. And this is like the antithesis of that. So if that tweet wound you up. Vecchio's definitely a wrestler to to look at. I just think his whole run has been captivated with this Berlin title. They're just mad spot fests, right on the cusp of each wrestler's ability. Not everything lands by any stretch of the imagination, sometimes literally, but you just can't take your eyes off them. Like, there's a, a brain buster on the apron, it just looks so dangerous. Um, the end of this was a sort of suplex into the ropes from Vecchio, into a powerball with a kick out, and the crowd just erupted. They were so behind Grochester, it was great. It was definitely face versus face, which I really appreciate. That's because... Another thing that's becoming a little bit of a litmus test for a promotion that are they brave enough to do a face versus face match? Because I, you know, I just trust the audience to enjoy it for what it is and enjoy it on face value. Crowchester had this big fight back. He went to the speed. He did a four fifty. He posed, and but then Mister Corkscrew and and then two power bombs were just a bit too much for him. And I found myself really loving Crowchester now. I, like I said, I always liked him and I always recognised that he was going to have good matches, but I didn't always get excited for them. And I think now I will. This was a match where he lost, but he got over. And I, I, I really like this title run. It's the perfect secondary title run for me. It's giving Vecchio something to do. It's keeping him bubbling. It's keeping him over. He's probably not somebody you're going to make your world champion, at least not yet, but he's someone you can do a lot with and they're getting people over with this run and I I, I think the champ, the championship run, this Berlin title run, has been great. There was a tag team match, Kendo Boys against uh, Sem Kaplan and Itak Baha. Uh, Kendo Boys are very inexperienced. Um, it's Itak, really, that I've been keeping an eye on. This was decent enough. Kaplan's got a ceiling. He can throw people around with decent suplexes, but there wasn't really much. It's a report. It's not really a match that I would recommend watching. Then we had the main event. GWF world title match. Senza Volto against Tony Hartim. Really glad to see Volto back. There was that show. What show did we review a while back? And he got injured. Was it in Hungary? Um, and I know there was a load of trouble with him getting like his, his car robbed and he just seemed to have a run of, of bad luck, really. And I've, I've not heard anything for a while. And I, I really like Senza Volto. He's just a big lucha, big strong lucha, uh, which, which is really cool. Um, Tony's band were back, which is good. We've got a little bit more gent. And again, we have that thing that I love. Volto bouncing at the start. Second the bell went. So did he. It was great. Huge punches. Massive dive. Volto was all over him like a rash. The problem is really... Well, there was a big problem later on in this match. But I think the problem in the middle is that Harting just has a little bit of a ceiling. You know, he relies on kind of cliched story at times. So with this... He brought Senza Volto's cool dives to a stop by just moving out the way before they started. And I get that that gets that traditional 
heel heat. But I think the way the crowd were and the way the, the promotion often feels is I kind of just wanted to see that dive. You know, the working standard at GWF feels slightly higher than this main event suggested. Maybe that's because we just come off an Axel Tisha run, and Axel Tisha's obviously fantastic, but it feels like he didn't meet the working standard um, of this of, of the promotion. And it's a shame, because he can do cool stuff. He can do big suplexes. Maybe it is that juxtaposition against Axel Tisha. His control period had the decency to be fast, if not particularly exciting. Uh, but obviously you've got Senza Volta there. So when Senza Volta took over, it was exciting. And it was one of those matches where I found myself rooting for Volto for my own kind of future sanity. Like I wanted him to win to become the champion so we'd get more exciting matches going down the line. Uh, and the crowd seemed to feel the same. But this just descended into into nonsense. Big Nick was outside supporting um, Harting, and he put a mask on, pretending to be Volto. They had this thing where they do the pin. Um, I just I don't like that sort of stuff in main events. I'm one of those traditionalists in a lot of ways, and I, obviously you're free to disagree with me on this one. But I just feel like your main event should be a wrestling match. You know they've got things like the loser weight title, which is great lower down the card for this sort of thing, for the sort of shenanigans and comedy wrestling. Whereas I just feel like your main event, that should be where you do your proper wrestling, you know? Don't know if if, if that's a bit of a hot take or not, but I, I just felt like it was stupid. Big Nick did lots of distractions, things like low blows leading to the finish. and I feel like if you establish this sort of thing in your main event, and this is a big part of the reason why I stopped watching American wrestling um sort of after the Attitude Era, is because they established that this sort of thing was going to happen in all the main events. And you kind of just end up switching off. You know, essentially, that what you're seeing probably isn't going to mean anything or have any impact. It's just going to be a case of waiting until the interference and the silliness. I think that's a stylistic thing. I'm, the crowd did seem to be into it. So maybe that's just a, a genre thing with me. But like I say, it seems a shame that we've gone from a Tisha run that I really enjoyed to, to this. It, it just seems a little bit jarring, really. But we'll see how long he's the champion for. He has been the champion before, and they do tend to do longer runs. Have I closed the Sorry, I've closed the cage. Match. No, I haven't. Let's have a look. They do tend to do longer runs. So, I mean, Tisha 217, John Klinger 925, but that was locked down. 182, 357. There's a few shorter ones, but then, you know, the, a, a, a title reign of a year plus is not uncommon um, in this company. Um, Two Cold Scorpio held it for 877 days. He only had one match in it. <laughs> I suppose that makes it easier when you don't run as many shows. Uh, they run more shows these days. But I, I think, yeah, I, th I think we might have to accept that we'll have Tony Hart in for a while. But there's always something on a GWF show. There's always something to get you excited. There's always at least one match worth watching. And as I say, it's free on YouTube. Um, often, be careful with these because often they don't always make them obvious. They get, I think they get more money off the, off the live viewer. Um, so you watch it live and they put the links up on Twitter. So, But often that means that they're not on the page. So you have to go through the Twitter. But I would I would really recommend them. So that's it for the wrestling then. Um, I know it's been a very news-heavy show, but let's wrap things up with some talk about Justin Sizer. Justin Sizem was the World of Sport champion and he wrote this open letter uh, right when NXT UK was taking off. And he's, there's been a lot of jokes about Justin Sizem going around and how people should apologise to him. And I, th I think it's worth going back and reading this opening, reading this open letter because it's, it's brilliantly articulate. Um, he says, Last week it came to light through independent UK promotions who have been left uncertain of the future with WWE NXT UK talent have apparently been signed to new contracts allegedly preventing them from wrestling for any promotion outside the WWE banner. Uh, talent can honour bookings that they've got till the end of the year but they can't 
wrestle anyone who is contracted for New Japan, Impact, Ring of Honor, World of Sport, and other... I love that. New Japan, Impact, Ring of Honor, World of Sport, and other major promotions. Chucking in World of Sport there. Uh... WWE have a history of trying and succeeding to conquer small promotions. Many believe that the NXT UK brand was only reignited this year once they caught wind of wrestling returning to British television without them signing their roster um, within weeks of the TV tapings being announced. I personally fear for a future not too far away where WWE has succeeded in its mission and as a consequence destroyed much of our thriving domestic scene. This was tweeted in 2018 by the way, just I think that's important. Listen to this. If they eventually decide that they no longer need the expense of a UK brand and pack up, this will leave us with a decimated British independent scene. Wrestlers will find themselves with less places to work and yet still have to bow to the king that is WWE so that one day they may be considered for a job. He's actually quite nice. He says, I understand why people take these contracts for a lot of people. And again, I think this is weird for me to understand. For a lot of people, it is their dream to wrestle for the WWE. And and that is what it is. Um, He wishes them all the success. And he says, I'm not going to pander to anything that restricts anything. I'm going to stay away from the WWE. Uh, I'm not going to tiptoe around it. I don't want a job with them, which, okay. like It's kind kind of like when Chris Brooks went, I will not sign the contract. It's like, oh, was it an option? I don't know. he says he, he sort of rallies the ring crew and events and staffs and fellow wrestlers together. And he, he, he finishes with, I'd sooner die on my sword in defeat than watch what makes our industry so free, diverse and inclusive for both wrestlers and fans alike get eroded away as part of a corporate strategy to get a bigger share price and global market position. It, I remember reading that at the time and thinking, good on you, Justin. And I'm reading this now and thinking, oh, my word. Scroll down a little bit if you find the tweet. First reply from... I love the fact that Twitter updates your name because this reply is now from Pete Butch Dunn. And it says, every step myself and other members of the NXT UK roster have taken within WWE over the past two years has been nothing but a benefit to the independent scene. Whose words have aged better there, do we think? Justin Sizems or Pete Butch Dunn? What about Trent Seven, who said, Hang your head in shame, Justin. We've all worked incredibly hard over the past few years to create create a thriving scene for all levels of talent to perform on. Delete your tweet and stop attention seeking. Again, who should be handing the hanging their head in shame here? Weird, isn't it? How it's come out. Anyway, we'll leave it at that. Um I had to mention NXT UK this episode, and if it's the first time you're listening to me, I, as a rule of thumb, I don't, and I don't have to now because it's disappeared. I'll sort of keep up with it from a news point of view, but I, I think I, I couldn't not give my thoughts on this. And like I say, I'm expecting lots of people to disagree with me on it, and that's absolutely fine. Remember, Socratic conversation, we can learn from each other. I'm more than willing, and I have done in the past to come on this show, and if somebody said something that's made me reevaluate my position, I've changed my position. Um, and I hope you extend me the same courtesy. So I hope you have a lovely fortnight. I'm off to enjoy some cheese and crackers. I will see you in a couple of weeks with some more happenings from the British and European wrestling scene. See you in a bit. <laughs> <laughs>